Alrighty, welcome everyone, I'm Tiabu and I am back for more Mawaru Penguin Drum. Last week we watched episodes 17 and 18 and a whole bunch of stuff happened in them, so I have gone back through them uh, and taken some notes to help me through talking through all of the events that occurred. In episode 17, we started off pretty cute and continuously devolved into terrifying. And then 18, we started off terrifying and got more terrifying until things were resolved. Uh, we started off 17 with some takoyaki and then some shopping, which eventually led to an all-out ridiculous battle between Masako and Yuri over the two halves of the diary, which at this point... Um, after like re-skimming the episodes both during editing and then this morning strikes me as kind of ridiculous that they're fighting over this diary because I don't think it's the penguin drum and I've been saying that since the beginning and I, I still don't think it's the penguin drum so I think we're supposed to be kind of having a laugh at their ridiculous battle going on here in the background regardless. It's also functional because both of them are out of the picture for what occurs next, which is we go on a nice little adventure to the construction site with Tabuki, uh, leading us directly into episode 18 as they enter the very cage-like uh, elevator that takes them up, up, up um, into another place. And then we start off episode 18 with an, a, a crazy set of like paintings um, and a story about Tabuki's beginnings and introduction to Momoka, uh, beginning with his realization that his mother only wants talented people and only cares about talented people and the knowledge that he himself was no piano prodigy. So he slams the cover of the piano on his own hands, effectively trading one kind of pain for another in avoiding failure by preventing himself from actually having the capacity to try. And his mom just does not care about him because he's got this little brother who's actually a prodigy. And she just gives all her attention to him and he ends up in the place where abandoned children go, aka the child child broiler where kids are unsummarily just 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 mashed together into an amalgamated mess of shattered mirror imagery and turned into conformist uh, sarariman i at least that's that's the way i'm going with it the way that i'm interpreting it and it was pretty fucking amazing. Um, then we enter the supervillain lair, specifically Kamba enters the supervillain lair. Shoma's off running around and eventually will be running toward this destination. But for now, this is Kamba's challenge at the moment. He enters the supervillain lair of Tabuki, where he finds his damsel, Himari, uh, dangling over a pit and presumably death, uh, in a bathtub, which is kind of weird, but okay, sure, he had it around. And, um... Converses with Tabuki a little bit. Tabuki views himself as bringing down the punishment that Kamba's family deserves and stuff like that. But there's a lot more complicated stuff going on there because of the whole Jesus imagery and magical girl uh, Momoka coming in and saving him from the child broiler. So he first tells Kamba that he knows that Kamba's money is coming from the father's uh, organization, a.k.a. the remnants of the cult that incited the attack. So Am Shinri Shinryuko lives, kind of, uh, which is a nice reveal because we've been waiting to find out what Kamba has been doing for that money. We don't really know what he's been doing for it, but we know at this point that he's working with his father's organization as a way to get money. Whether he knows it's his father's organization or not, I'm a little bit confused on, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and then puts the challenge in front of him, which is that I'm going to snap all these wires. Your only shot at saving this damsel, this person who you love, is to sacrifice your own hand the same way that Momoka sacrificed her hand for my hand in order to hold her there. Uh, and Kamba happily does so. Or, well, not happily, but he, there, there's no question that he's going to do it. We've seen Kamba do crazy shit to try and save Himari all the way through. It is, it is a large portion of his his character is his willingness to sacrifice himself, his soul, uh, working for an or organization that he has problems with, all, all kinds of things in order to save Himari. So he does it, and in that moment, uh, Tabuki realizes that his... Oh, uh, bleh, bleh, I missed Himari's sac self-sacrifice. This is why I wrote all this shit out. Okay, so he, he does it, he's holding her up via a bathtub and like holding up a gigantic bathtub and wires and stuff and his hands are bleeding and it's it's awful uh and then himari can't take it doesn't want him to sacrifice himself for her anymore knows that she is on her way out um that her disease is incurable and she's right probably uh so she jumps and sacrifices herself in order to prevent him from sacrificing himself to save somebody who cannot be saved which Makes a lot of sense, given the way that this story has been going. It is my fate to die eventually. I might as well die now, and that way you can live on. But, Tabuki 
saves her. He grabs her out of out of her free fall, we assume, uh, because he is reminded by Kamba's self-sacrifice of Momoka's own self-sacrifice. And he walks away learning very little, um, but views himself as a monster and leaves. At which point he uh, he gets a fatty slap across the face from from Yuri, and we discover that her fight with Masako seemingly ended in a draw because they both have their own parts of the diary. And then our whole family back together at this construction site just takes a moment to just like ah, and breathe and just like oh god that was hard, uh, and that's kind of where we left off. So. What the hell do we do now? I don't know. I, Tabuki seemed like he walked out of the picture. Yuri and Masako uh, don't seem like they've resolved anything, but they had their big battle. Uh, can we go back to any level of cuteness at this point? I don't know. I don't know where we start at this point. I feel like the thing to pursue is Kamba and the father's organization thing, but I don't know how because it's so in the background at this point that I, I don't know. I'm... Um, I know that we start with a flashback, um, because I can see the first frame of the of the video, and it's a flashback. I'm a little bit a little bit baffled. I don't know where we can go from here. This was a pretty climactic episode, pretty pretty interesting, but it clearly hasn't. It doesn't feel like an Ikuhara finale episode, and I I know that, and I, I know that it's not the finale, and I'm coming in with that meta knowledge, but it doesn't feel like we've wrapped up our themes quite yet. There's still a lot on the table that hasn't been explained, like the fruit, <laughs> and and the penguin drum, and 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 so many things. Okay, that's all I got for the past two episodes. They were pretty awesome. Episode 18 in particular was visually stunning start to finish and incredibly well directed and the background art and like way of framing things was just nutty and I think that most of that gets credited to the person who episode directed at 18 um, but I'm not not entirely sure but a gorgeous episode regardless very very interesting and lots of Utena vibes kind of adolescency vibes mixed into it. Really cool episode. Let's see if the next two live up to the past two. I don't know. I don't know. Let's watch episode 19 and, uh, I don't know. I don't know. yeah, let's watch it. I've got it up. It's ready to go. It's zero seconds. There'll be two versions as usual. You can find a picture in picture version in the description, time based version up on YouTube. And if you want to do a sync thing and sync up your own copy with the time based version, you are welcome to do so. Just get your copy ready because the beep beep timer to count you down will be coming at you uh, now. I hit it through to the end. Through to the end? This is a secret I cannot reveal. Whose perspective was that from? Okay, we're seeing the climax again. And the red string of fate. I believe it. Ogi Kubo's Flavorina. Who that? <laughs> what? No, 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 no. Uh, no, 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 no. no? It's a fat stack. I want to go to a bar and get paid. That sounds great. <laughs> Is this different? No. Okay. They're just chilling. They're just they're just chilling in the city. That's not okay. They're mass murderers. <laughs> they're just chilling in the city.
And Kamba's in contact? <laughs> I'm a little freaked out by that. Was that apple with the spinning thing around it always there? Because I just noticed it for the first time. It doesn't change much, like, we've seen the imagery before. You're running off your own direction, Kamba. And then folding in with Esmeralda, huh? Uh, 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 different teacher. Yeah, uh, 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 I wonder why. Yeah, I'm probably. How you doing, Shoma? You're pretty much in the dark about everything. Huh. It's rather cold, but their relationship was a fake family, right? It's fabulous Mont Blanc. Curry Day. We made the promise on we should be able to make Momoka an eternal existence. They made this pro Oh. Is this the day that Mom that um Ringo saw them through the window? It's darker but rainy. Bound by the wheel of fate. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That curry don't have apples in it. Girl, you crazy. But we knew that. Now I feel bad. Hello, new Ringo. Okay. So, Masako. Same thing she said before, but now there are curtains and it's still cold. Wow, we are back here. Uh, nice timing, Penguin. Uh -huh. When's Sonatoshi gonna drop the other shoe, though? <gasps> oh, stacks on stacks on stacks. Shh, shh, shh. Where are you working, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> it's so bright and colorful. I'm terrified. Oh, are those the, the sweater? Kimura, you're the best. I, I love you, and I hate that because we're just gonna murder you again, and then I will feel terrible. What was that look from Kamba? The fuck are those? Hmm. Hey, close, close, close. The uh -huh. This is a weird perspective. Very strangely framed, but interestingly, like intentionally. Okay. Hey. Everybody full. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
Uh, we're not doing that again. <laughs> Let's not do that again, please. No Cabal. No not me episodes, please. I like them being chill. Yeah. I feel you, Himari. This is cute. Oh, never mind. I don't LP quite. Oh. Oh, we're just going to hit all, about, all the beats where you don't feel like you're needed anymore. Just going to hit them all at the same time. Fuck. Ah, uh, you about to drop the other shoe? Wow. I really like that super close up. That one too. The silhouette against the monitors. Huh. How to create your comfortable place of belong. Oh, that would be it. And it's got an apple on the back. Oh. Maintain your precious family life. You know all of those things, bud. I know you do. Wow, that line of shadow just curving around her face. That was really cool. Oh, hello. Huh? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. So what gives it power? Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Okay. A fate transfer. Carrot. Okay. Nope. Yeah, it's magic. Yep. Goral, you shoot pi how to live without being deceived. Hmm. Goral, you shoot ping pong balls that erase people's memories. I, I think it's time to start believing in magic. Excuse me? She is refusing once more. Uh, I won't let combat either. You're too late. Why do you want to burn the O? Oh. Don't fucking... Yuri? Somebody? Keep it around. Don't burn it. It's real important. You know not what you do. Ooh, there's a flash of color in that scene. The little, little bit of purple there. That was, that was kind of cool. Gosh, I must crush her soon. Which girl? Momoka? I would really love to find out. Truth is born from... Where's her problem with Himari? Sure, bud. 
equal and opposite. But what if what if you do something worse? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Eh, don't know about that. He says while interacting with Hello Cupid. I want my family. Or is it something else? Maybe the boy with the apple that she saw? I don't know. I'm reaching. Okay. <laughs> wow. That was a little bit of a moment. Oh, that's Masako? Hi. Oh, boy. Okay. Please don't. It's from the Natsume Corp or just the wrapping paper? Okay. Not that I could stop you. Fuck off, it's comfy. Fuck off, it's cozy. Sporkle, sporkle. Foreheads? Oh. Okay. I guess don't drink the tea. I'll drink it for you. Not really. No. No, he hasn't. Did they have the diary? Or, hey, Sparkle. Sparkle? <laughs> <laughs> I love this conversation. Oh. Are you not? She's adopted? <laughs> Define real family, though. She's as real as any, any family, blood ties or no. And that means that she's not tainted by the blood of the father. Right? Yeah, get the fuck out of my house. Get the get, 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 get the fuck out of my house. You can't just walk in here and be like, oh yeah, bitch, you adopted. Not sorry. Stop pretending to be my boyfriend's sister. What the fuck? But on a greater level of what the fuck. Is Himari adopted? Did we talk about it at some point? As like a, a an oddball theory? I think we did. Please. Tell us everything. Uh, what are you about to? Okay, it's a blue one. Oh. Not nah, take me on a ride, Masako. I'm intrigued. And she's desperate to find that now, so she will do it. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh. <laughs> the face. Oh, 
split screen. <laughs> That's why. Again, man, you can't even hit that target. Are we going to hit Shoma with it? No. Oi. Oi. Did Himari just get hit by a car? Not to make Corp. What the fuck? This is like a video game level. Top down. 2D plane. Oh, also a really cool scene. <clears throat> Himari, please don't get crushed by a giant marble. Foiled by her own corporate interests. This is surreal. Why are we dragging this particular moment out? Just because it's fucking ridiculous? Because it is. And cornered. Oh. Yeah, give me the download. Ah, we were so close to finding out something really interesting. Spinning, spinning. Will that flash her back? Yeah, we're hearing it. It will. To the child broiler? Hey! There's someone precious to me that day in the frozen world I met my fate. Okay, okay, okay. She was there, an abandoned child. Until she met someone who gave her. Same lines as Tabuki got. Right. Hello again, Administrator. The scarf? Who are you? Who are you? Show me. Show ma? No, that's the voice of the rabbits. That's the voice of the bunnies. N now, that's somebody else. Show my... Ooh, I like this one. Ah.
Oh, I didn't take nearly enough notes in this episode. I was just enthralled. Oh, damn it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I like this one. I've liked them all. I met my fae. That's fucking cool. The depth in the eyes, the shadow, the way the shadows line up with the fan. But it's it's not that she's standing in front of a fan. It's that she's standing against a, a dark wall and there's a, a fan this way from the camera and light is streaming in from it. And we're seeing it hitting her and it's that's why it's like that. That's so cool. I love it. <laughs> Lily Hoshino and 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 negative space is like a match made in heaven. This is so it's so nice. Okay, uh, this was an episode. We started off way cuter and sweeter than I thought we would. Well, we didn't start off that way. We started off with this shit, uh, which doesn't make me pleased. But Combo's interacting with the fam. We're just gonna skim through real quick, and then I'm gonna go do like a a more in-depth skim to try and get my thoughts together all right we get school uh tabuki this is tabuki's farewell sort of uh tabuki leaves a note and has quit his job at school in rainy days we find out that yuri and tabuki made this pack together on a curry day obsessed with masa with with momoka and and becoming a real family and getting her back and then we get this moment with yuri where she is fucking sad and it was impossible for us all after all. And then she ends it off by saying it's super cold in here, although she has already gone and purchased the expensive curtains that she wanted. And the purchase of those items has not helped her feel less cold because that's not the kind of cold that she feels. She feels that emptiness. And then we transition from dreary, cold, rainy, awful, an individual person who has pushed away everybody else in their lives and, and lost family to the happiest family. We're sitting around eating eating payday uh, uh, sukiyaki. That's what it is, right? I think so. And um, it looks fucking awesome. It's super tasty. And we're all being happy. And and we deliver deliver the sweaters in their colors. And that's nice. And that's super great. And then we have this whole sequence, which is a very strange framing where we're like focused on Shoma. Uh, and then we've got got Ringo in the frame, and we're kind of like shippity shippiting Shoma and Ringo, which I just realized comes into play with the thing we find out at the very end, and holy crap, that's amazing. And we get this whole sequence, which again is in its stark color palette with the, the, the rabbit sucking tubes of carrot juice, but they're also alternately eating carrots, and then they're later sucking on juice boxes of carrots. And then there are some, some frames in here that I dig like crazy this is really cool um this ultra close up and then there's one a little bit later of the mouth i love this one as well it just splits the frame down the middle and creates a really interesting shape um i like it a lot it's it's just aesthetically cool and there are weird things written on all their books and i i, I they're, they're related to the conversations that they're having uh their rel relative penguins are using self-help books to try and figure out the same answers that they're seeking from Sonatoshi, and both are equally useless, it seems. Um, it's real interesting. Real, real, real interesting. And she answers that she wants to, things to stay the way they are, and Sonatoshi gives us an indication that she is a little bit... Uh, there's more going on here than we actually understand at this point. Also love this frame, the way that the light uh, creates this line of shadow that outlines her, her nose and lips and stuff is standard, but it just it just looks really cool here. I don't know what to say about it. I've seen this kind of shading throughout Ikuhara shows, but man, it looks good right here. Real good. 
All right, and then we do the same thing with Masako. Uh, yeah, and we get some lines. I will have the children accomplish what their parents could not. Whole lot of things coming together here. One, Sanatoshi's a puppet master. And two, uh, is Sanatoshi somehow responsible for the original at subway attack and everything in the story so far because of it? I'd say there's a pretty solid chance, given that he's trying to accomplish this thing still, and there's an implication that he has already attempted to accomplish it and is just pushing the children to do more of it. What he's trying to accomplish exactly? A little bit, uh, a little bit unclear at the moment. Not quite sure. Not quite certain. Uh, okay, great. We'll move on from here because that's a thing. And we discover that he is more than just a little bit of a puppet master. He is desperately trying to burn this diary, the thing that en enables the transfer of fate, because he cannot do it himself. Gives me some sort of, like, I don't know, I guess one ringy type of vibes. Like, oh, I can't actually destroy the thing, but, like... I don't know. It doesn't give me one ring vibes. I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a big magoober that he needs destroyed and out of the way. Um... I guess maybe he's trying to lock them into some specific path of fate and the ability to change the lanes of fate um, to essentially derail the world. Yeah, that makes sense. That lines up with all of his speeches before about wanting to get the world, quote unquote, back on track and asking everybody or forcing them regardless of, of if, if they're down, if they're amenable, he just asks them to do it. And if they're not, he just manipulates them into doing it to getting onto the train that leads to the destination of his fate or whatever so the power to derail that would be a problem for him why he wants that unclear but what if i really need this to save mario good question good question and we get that girl's fault and we finally discover that the one that she has wanted to crush is and has always been probably kimari Truths born from lies. Oh boy. This conversation with uh, Shomakamba is pretty interesting. I've already taken the punishment. There will certainly be no further punishment coming down from on high against me. Right. Good luck with that, buddy. Haha. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely took the whole punishment already. There is definitely nothing else coming your way. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> sure. It's all our parents' fault. Himari's illness, too. And there we come to the most interesting thing in the episode, which is, if, and we can assume this is the case, if Himari is adopted, let's say, uh, in the moment where Shoma reaches out and gives her the fruit of fate, I guess, um, the apple, the Kiga apple, and invites her into his family, she is adopted by them, by their family. Into all the troubles and all the bad things that that brings, but... There, there is a consistent thing in this show that the sins of the parents will echo down toward their children. And there is a problem and an answer to that, kind of. It's, a, it's not so much an answer, it's a, it's, a, it's a questioning of that perspective within the context of the show. We set forth that perspective, and then as in a dialectic, we set forth things that maybe question that perspective. The scenario that we're in right now deeply questions that perspective. We have two contradictory pieces of information. One is, the sins the parents are passed down to the child, therefore Himari's punishment is, or Himari's illness is a punishment for the sins of her parents. I guess there are three pieces of information that are important here. Second one. Uh, 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 Shit, I just forgot. Second one, Himari's not actually part of their family, thus the, the, the sins the parents should not be passed down to her. Third comes in the line that Masako says, which is, you're not even his real family. And therein lies the, the rub, if you will. Himari is more family to Kamba Shoma than literally anybody else, including their actual parents despite their blood ties. We have talked often about finding family in this show, uh, or in our discussions of this show. We have talked about it often, and we could say pretty wholeheartedly that Himari has found family amongst them to the point where she doesn't even know that she's not a part of their family. So, is it the blood? Is it the connection? Is it 
just silly superstition? Is it something more ethereal that passes up all, uh, along this kind of a punishment? Or is the idea of a punishment passed through a bloodline or through familial connection utterly ridiculous, full stop? Is the idea that your fate is entwined with those you're connected with, either by blood or by just knowing them and loving them and being with them, is that a ridiculous idea? Maybe. Maybe. It's an interesting question either way. Set of questions. Okay. Okay, Kohara. That brings us to about the halfway point of the episode. There's so much more. Uh, Moscow arrives. It's real scary. She berates the, the family awesomeness. We've got this whole on high, low down on the floor perspective thing going on as she sits in the chair and, and Himari sits on the floor uh, by the table. It creates a dynamic. Uh, the whole conversation that they have spirals into ridiculousness. It's like every every line that they say at each other is a shit passing in the night and they just like miss it and don't really understand what the other person is talking about. And then it just builds from there into ridiculousness. It's like, well, maybe I can go get your present back. And she's like, that's not what I mean. Fuck you. Look, I'm just going to shoot you in the forehead and we'll, we'll deal with this. Let me just, let me just mind meld with you really quick. Give you your memories back. Uh, so that happens. Then everybody shows up, which is kind of a, a ridiculous sequence that almost reminds me of uh, there's a scene in a comedy thing where like, stop, we're the police. And then, then stop, we're the FBI. And then no, stop, we're the CIA or whatever. It's ridiculous. All right, and then Combo tries to stop her. She's trying to shoot her, and then a fucking Natsume truck outside with giant balls of stone, I assume, uh, just rolling everywhere, creating a horrifying death trap as Himari cowers behind a giraffe as as she continues shooting slow-mo blue jectiles at her in order to make her remember her memory, and we are treated to sequences of them running through the rain in slow motion with heavy breathing. That happens. I don't know why that happens. It conveys the whole thing, I guess, and creates a really interesting and strange action sequence. But what? It's an idea. It's a weird idea. I've never seen anything quite like it. I don't know if I like it. I do, actually. I do know that I like it. I, I, I like this sequence. I don't know why the fuck it's here, but... Okay. C cool? And then shot, and then flashback, and same lines, lots of similar things here. Child broiler, I assume these are all, yeah, these are all hiragana, but I don't care enough to actually go and look up what they actually say, because blah. And she gets a lot further along the path, meets blue-haired child, who we presume is Shoma. Uh, he speaks in the voice of the rabbits for a little while, which is kind of weird to me. Um... A little freaked out by that. We get some really interesting texturally backgrounds here with the mirrors everywhere. And he extends out this fruit of fate was Shoma. And Shoma is my soulmate, which brings up a problem given that Shoma and Ringo seem to be getting a little bit closer together. And Himari seems a little bit jelly of that. Please, let's not have a love triangle in the last five episodes of this show, please. I mean, we've had love triangles before, but they were ridiculous. Like Ringo, Tabuki, uh, uh, Yuri as a love triangle has actually become a really interesting part of the plot. All e each of the characters has gone separate in different directions. The whole thing exploded, and and all of them died. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kill kill my whole family. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take a minute, skim through the episode again, catch anything that I like totally missed or skipped. And then we will um, we'll come back for discussion about that. And then we'll jump into episode 20. Yeah, 20. Okay, we're getting up there. So I'll, I'll see you in a minute. And if I if I didn't miss anything, we'll, we'll just move along. See you in a minute. Peace. Okay, on reskim, I didn't, didn't get a lot of crazy new stuff. But I did find the two transitions around this warm familial scene really interesting. We already mentioned the one from... From Yuri in the cold, rainy, awful into bright, warm, happy, real family. Um, and then this is also kind of given context by the conversation that they have here where Yuri says, uh, it'll just be pretend it. F where is it? I don't know where it is. 
We should be together. Yeah, it'll be pretend at first, but eventually we'll become a real family. Um, but can't be for them. It just doesn't work because they're. I don't know. I would say. I would say in context of story, because they're as obsessed with the past and reclaiming something that no longer exists, that exists in the same way that Ringo was when we first met her. It's just, it's just the wrong goal for the both of them, and so it won't work. And then we transition over here where Ringo has cast aside that desire for the past and has integrated well into this wonderful, warm, welcoming family that is... And we find out cobbled together from bits and bobs of unwanted children. I think that's really interesting. And then we transition from the same kind of sequence where in episode one, Himari said, this is bliss, to a moment where where Himari doesn't feel like she's a part of this. It's weird. It's different. It's very different for her. Um, Like... You're the guest of honor. Just relax. You know, you'll turn into a cow, whatever. They're, 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 it's really pleasant that they're like, they're, they're playing with each other and they're kind of poking at each other. And it's, it's fun and familial and, and lovely. But in contrast to them working together, Himari seems very alone. And then we hit this beat and she looks up from that beat to find the next worst thing in her life, which is, again, not not making it as one of these idol groups. And while she has professed to be okay with that and has been... I don't want to be mean to Himari here, but she's been kind of a doormat about a lot of the things going on in her life. She seems a little bit less content with it at this moment. And it is there that we get the the hospital transition and enter this room where... Sanatoshi prods at exactly that. Oh, it must have been wonderful to spend, or electrifying, to spend time with just her, your family. I don't want to, I don't want to meme about it, but this is a big mood. This is a, a big, big depressed mood. Oh, you've got everything you could possibly want. It must be wonderful for you. Why do you feel so sad and like you're not actually welcome in your own home? It's a big mood. It sucks. I feel really bad for Himari here. And it's given that weight by the transition between these scenes. I really enjoy that. I, it's, it's good. And for the first time, she kind of stops being a, a doormat about this. And she's been a little bit of a doormat about a lot of things, like, yeah, sure, I'll just accept the penguin hat, okay, I'm, I'm back to life, okay, I'm, in, I'm invaded by this weird alien entity that takes over my, my body, uh, and mind, and stuff, oh, you're just, you're just both going out to do stuff on your own, and leaving me here at home all the time, that's fine, and now she's... I guess I guess the moment where she jumped from, at least in headcanon, there's nothing to really indicate this, but for me in headcanon, the moment where she jumped and decided, I will sacrifice myself, I will prevent the two of you from continuing to sacrifice yourselves for something that is a lost cause by jumping out of this bathtub and falling to my death, um, because I know that I cannot be cured. That's a real big turning point for Himari. I'm curious what she's going to do from here. Now, this episode is chock full of tons of interesting exposition-y things. And it feels like a transition between arcs. And it feels like, given that, this last arc might finally focus on our, up to this point, damsel in distress and what she actually wants that's interesting. That's very interesting. Something else that I realized. Um, Sanatoshi wants everybody to get on that train of fate, which we saw as as full of, with Kamba in it, full of those dark, cloaked, hat-wearing peoples, a.k.a. the members of the Father's organization. 
Is Sanatoshi the the spark of that organization? Is he the one who created this whole thing? I think so. I feel like I think so. I'm not sure. And then Masako is also working for him, it seems. Which we, we already knew because of the phone calls. But Masako is also working for him, but is refusing to get on that train. And yet is being manipulated into doing so, I think. Maybe. Possibly. Okay. Well... That's all I've got for this episode. We'll move on to the next one. There's a garbage truck going by, so I'm going to take a break here and uh, be back in a minute for episode 20 of Mawaru Penguin Drum. See you there. Peace. All right, welcome back. We are ready, set, and good to go on episode 20 of Mawaru Penguin Drum. We are once again starting with a flashback frame. We'll see if it goes anything like last time or completely different. Probably completely different. I mean... Last episode was real exposition heavy. I feel like we're going to start something crazy now. Let's do it. Beep beep timer. Penguin forces a hideout inside a certain condo. I'll start here. Similar doors. Which one's real? Which one's righteous? This is a weird location. Okay, dividing lines, dividing lines. Is that the father? Leading the cult? But it's empty. Empty, empty, empty. It's very much like the library. A world by the, ruled by those who will never amount to anything. Listen up, you lowlifes who will never... The torch. Okay. From whose perspective was that flashback, I wonder? Does it matter? Dividing lines between sections of society, chosen and unchosen. And then endless gray apartment complexes, condominiums. Empty, empty, empty. A frozen world. Already a gray world that we live in. I didn't notice that it was train cars that formed that circle at first. Cool. Okay. And the rolling balls have stopped, and they are protecting her. Hi, Masako. Why not? Why not? Maybe. Okay, bye. Nice, nice to see you. She's gonna fucking die again. God damn it. 
Oh, yeah, she said Shochan, not Kamba. Paint. Soulmate. Okay. Okay. There's that cue. Back to Bliss. Tamagoyaki, rice. This is lovely. I'm terrified. <laughs> oh, I want... There are no peng there are no penguins around. Where are the penguins? Bruh. Oh, there they are. Oh, yeah, look away, Gamba. Sure. Your love? And the photo. If you don't chase, if you don't hunt, you will be the hunted. I won't fall in love. Bad son, Otoshi, no. What? What? Oh, it's that guy. Responsible for what? Bad apples? Hi, Ringo. One month's trash is another's treasure? Oh. 
Okay. This is where we met. I was alone back then. That's why I found her. Okay. This is after? Aha. Uh -huh. All in disarray now. Oh, hi. Is he holding a fruit? Our father? Dangling the fruit of fate over the edge. And sees Himari. Giraffes. And that scarf. Hello. There's that bear that sits next to her and two bunny slippers. Okay. Ah. Smart. I do. Sure. Those that. Huh? Oh, this episode's weird, man. Under the sea. Hello, Himari. What you doing over there? Oh, hello, Neko. Ooh. Don't give it kindness if you can't, if you can't be choosing. No pets allowed. And he does it anyway.
like you. Ikuhara, if you murder this kitten... Someone broke the rule recently. It will not be tolerated. Oh, motherfucker. Oh, my gourd. <laughs> Fuck you, Ikara. Fuck you. Buy truck. Fuck you, show. So you never shared the fruit with her. A note? Thank you for your cooperation. Obey the rules. Not quite. Okay. And he rejects that. And he goes to save Himari. Sayonara. Ha <laughs> ha on a train <sighs> she took the scarf Will he burst in like Momoka? We're just gonna hit that beat? Okay.
Okay. You have been chosen. Hey, Gendo. Kamba looking at his scars. For his own reason. And so you will sin again. Okay. I got nothing. I got nothing. Last episode was so straightforward with so many of its reveals, and this one just went off the deep end with the symbolism. Oh my god. What a feeling. Lily, the scarf and the sparkles in the shadow. Oh, ah, Lily. It's a really cool way of drawing tears. Lily, Jesus. Wow. Okay. I thought I was prepared for something crazy. Um, was not at all prepared for this. 
again, kind of, okay, in the same way that uh, episode 18 had a very distinctive feel to it, like, oh, there's somebody in, in the episode director position who's making this one happen. This episode also has a very distinctive, clearly different feel to it. Uh, the dramatic tension in so many of these scenes and the ability to convey like starkness and bleakness in these, these sequences of the condominiums. Um, and then the incredible conveyance of emotional connection seen throughout the majority of the episode's runtime, which is taken up by the story of Himari and Sho actually meeting each other and coming to be friends is incredibly well conveyed all the way through. And it's not like on a, on a minor technical level, it's on a w the way this is put together type of level, which is something that obviously Ikuhara is good at, but this is different. And I would like to know who did this. But I'm reluctant to look it up because because then I'll get bogged down into looking stuff up. Um, I I I need to go through like most of the lines in this episode again. But before we do that, there are a few things that I just want to focus on as amazing. Uh, when the music kicks in for this this final sequence, was not ready for that. Um, and that hit hard. That was. That was that was nutty good. I was kind of half expecting a rel relatively simple like, oh, he's the Momoka to her play. And we kind of have that. But then the scene kicks in. We enter this this labyrinth of insane horror. The the damsel is there and Sho is the one who chooses her. The music kicks and the moment just lands. Absolutely amazing. Everything from the scarf to the strangeness of this, this like glowing chalk neon location to the tragedy of the kitten being taken away by the garbage truck, which fuck you show, that's not okay. And the clear connection between the lost kitten not allowed here, uh, being taken in by them despite knowing that it'll probably not work out and him finding a lost Himari, choosing her, choosing to take her in even though it might not work out is relatively obvious but man the the voiceover from from himari and her voice actress just nails ow i just nailed my fingernail um nails the emotional content of so many lines as a child and as an adult speaking over narrating things amazing um general atmosphere and feeling and things like the shoes being all in orderly rows and then later them being all in dis disarray uh the the strange warmth of this whole this whole moment that we get together which at this point in in the flow of the story when we get sort of a warm moment like this where it's like oh yeah there's sunlight peering in from the window and everybody's eating eating tamagoyaki and it's it's wonderful and we're talking about talking about soup and and the only thing that brings darkness upon it is this moment where uh i think himari says that this soup is just like mom's soup and uh show is like no we're the only members of this family we reject that and of course kanba looks away and then spends the rest of the scene with his eyes covered because he is still interacting with their parents um then we have this conversation about about chasing love. Uh, and Sanatoshi sees it as as a game to be kept going. I I guess infinite, I guess like the Mobius that's mentioned in the ED, but I'm not sure. This whole thing about kisses and kisses being perishable, but also sustenance to some extent. It's very curious. And the idea that he presents is a, a particular brand of weirdly symbolically veiled hedonism that says like, oh, the world will freeze anyway, you'll die anyway, just it, it would be better to, to, to die from experiencing the pleasures that life has to offer um, 
than to just die anyway without experiencing them. So you might as well. It's the same justification used for like, I'm going to eat whatever I want because I'm going to die anyway, but I'll die 20 years earlier. Waha. Or I'm going to smoke cigarettes because I, I love doing it and I'd rather die early than I'll die anyway, right? We're all dying. It's weird and fatalistic, and that makes a lot of sense given the context of the show that it appears in. The whole looming over her in a a kind of creepy way I don't really like very much and then we have a scene where Shoma and Faceless Friend are sorting trash as punishment for something that I don't know I don't know what it was but one rotten apple spoils the bunch one man's trash is another man's treasure right I don't know what that's referring to or who all of these sequences I I don't know when this would be so we've had one judgment day. Now we've changed our our thing. Masako is a part of this. Mario is a part of this. And she calls him brother. But I get the implication that it's like uh, uh, comrade. Like, you know, like, oh, yes, yes, brother. A, a we of this cult, this fraternity of ideal. Weird. She's upset that he's not paying attention to this, the, the, the thing, but he goes and follows Himari down the metaphorical rabbit hole a little bit. Is that a, a pomegranate? Is it meant to be, or is it meant to be a flower? Curious. I, I only mention that because, like, pomegranate is another fateful fruit in mythology specifically greek if i'm getting it right where you go into the into the underworld and if you eat the fruit the, the pomegranate you eat one seed even uh then you are required to stay there forever so i'm thinking that might have some kind of an, an indication here given that they're descending down a stairway but it seems like a stretch because it's yellow it's a yellow and red fruit which pomegranates are not so that's that's stupid Mom said not to take things for strangers. She says, while wrapped in the scarf, the connection has already been made. It's already going. Boy, oh boy. This is feels heavy. The moment where she disappears, I don't quite get. Uh, I don't know if she vanishes or just walks away. It's unclear from the cinematography, from the way it's shot, but it's a weird moment and an interesting one. Shoma's a wholesome bro. Trying to help out a cat, even knowing that it might not be the best thing to do. And then this conversation about a sunny spot is her name. She is their sunny spot, and that's pretty perfect. Then just the visual, like, splendor of this episode all comes to fruition. We were like a family. I'll never forget. It was the first time waiting wasn't painful. What's, what's really amazing about this is, okay... If we consider broad strokes, Himari in trouble on the precipice of bad juju of death or becoming invisible, whatever. Male character, brother of hers, running after her, chasing her in order to try and solve this problem and, and ensure her safety. Episode 18, Himari Kamba. Episode 20, Himari Shoma, completely different in every way in terms of how it's conveyed and the feeling that it gives off. That's kind of cool, right? That's, that's auteurism from whoever the fuck episode directed this. It's somebody, it's not the person who did episode 18, but it's somebody who knows what they're doing. So, I'm going to look them up. Back to ANN. Back to ANN. Uh, Penguin Drum. Whee! Episode directors. Episode directors. Episode 20. Anybody else listed for episode 20? No. Hayashi Akemi. Have I heard your name before? She. Ah, cool. Uh, I'm just going to control F for director. Animation director on Evangelion. Chief animation director on Fruits Basket. Oh! Character animation director in Die Buster for an episode. Animation director for episode 22 of Gurren Lagan. I don't remember which episode that is, but it's pretty far in there, so probably one of the cool ones. 
Uh, episode director for Japan Animator Expo. Sure. Sure, sure. Kids on the Slope unit director for the ED. Nurse Angel Ririka SOS. Sure. The animation on Oran. Storyboard episode director, animation director on episode 20 of Mawaru Penguin Drum. Everything. Also, key animation on OP 1 and 2 and episodes 1 and 24. Oh, cool. Animation director on Slam Dunk. Episode director of episode 5 of Space Dandy. I would need to know what episode that was. I'm just going to do, because uh, I've seen all of Space Dandy. List of Space Dandy episodes. Episode 5. Merry Companions is a wagon in space, baby. Uh, transfer minds into dolls. I don't remember much about this episode. Okay. Too bad. Might have been something interesting there. Unfortunately, that doesn't that doesn't give us anything. But uh wow. Wow. Okay. Cool. I'm just still wowed by this episode. I'm going to need to take a minute and just go through it again. Fuck. Oh man, these endless empty... This is the stuff that stands out to me the most, though. These endless and en empty landscapes, blocky and gray and, and dirty and almost rusty. These condominiums. As though... Like, it's a conscious decision to have the, the ideology or the, the demagoguery... Demag I think that's right, uh, of their father speaking over these empty, gray, tired, beaten-down landscapes that are industrial and in the same way that we've used industrial things as, like, the world is against you, that's the mentality and the mindset that goes along with his ideas and ideals both times that they're said until we actually enter the room. He's talking about the profitable and the unprofitable, and all of this is backed by effectively, like, low-income, um, <sighs> homogenous housing. People living in little boxes with nobody outside, nobody talking, nobody connecting. And it's weird in this place for someone to go outside of their own ideological little box and try to pursue somebody else and actually have a conversation and meeting with them but the moment that shoma does it he's disconnected from the people back there who wonder why he's not listening to the speech and connected on a much deeper much more intimate level with the person he goes after himari it's i mean as far as like as I'm thinking it through, the symbolism here is actually pretty clear-cut, isn't it? Lots of people in their own ideological boxes, not reaching out to each other. Shoma steps outside of that as a childish whim and finds reality, real family, real connection, truth out there. In a moment shared with this girl who's been abandoned and would be turned into nothing if he hadn't reached out. Given the show's focus on connection family real bonds and it's undercurrents of this is what's wrong with our society is that these things are not present this functions pretty solidly and a lot more straightforwardly than it seems at first viewing yeah that works that works real well that worked real good okay <laughs> oh, okay i can work with that all right, we enter this moment again. Moscow says some, some, some prodding stuff. We have this moment where we we lapse into a, a an almost watercolory type aesthetic, which is really pretty. And then memories return. A cute family moment together. And then this conversation, which is severely undercut by the crazy ass bunnies being assholes, in the same way that the penguins undercut a lot of our points. But then we have this conversation about kisses and the fruit 
And I don't know how much of it is sexual imagery or symbolism and how much of it is like weird metal layered multi symbolic bullshit. I, I don't know. Just don't know. I will say I really enjoy that we're continuing to 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 show and build upon the connection between Ringo and Shoma. They they're like hanging out a lot and that's pretty cool. They're being like genuine friends and family. It's kinda nice. Uh I have a feeling it's gonna get fucked up by something, but I like it right now. I have that feeling because everything that I like about this show gets fucked up. Although that's one of the things that I like about this show, so whatever. We flash forward. Apparently this is after the first attack. Uh, spin everywhere in his words. The same frames repeated. Actually, the fact that we repeat the same the same sequence as we enter this location is kind of kind of kind of an, again another pretty straightforward symbolic touch nothing has changed in the ideological box it is still the same they have learned nothing they have changed no nothing the world still is exactly the way that it was before and we demonstrate that by showing the exact same set of shots this one with the two buildings up close in shadow and then the one after it where we pan up slowly into the light and then the one after that where we're on this hallway where it vanishes out into infinity and then the door and then inside and the first change that we have is that their shoes are not or all orderly in rows they're all just sort of haphazardly thrown there it's weaker now because we've done it once and it didn't work almost in the same way that a uh a Let's say a false prophet who tells us, like, oh, in, in year 2000, the world is going to end. Or better better yet, it's 1650, whatever. Jesus is definitely coming back this year. Oh, he didn't come back this year. It's 1650 the year after. Oh, Jesus is definitely coming back this year. Oh, he didn't come back this year either. It's 1675, and then they're following Peter's out because people are like, yeah, you're, you're sure he is, bud. It's that kind of thing going on here. It's the same speech. It's the same ideology. And there is a new generation involved, but people don't quite care as much, it seems. Maybe. That's one way to take it. Over the course of the show, we've implied strongly that this fruit of fate, whatever it may be, is really important and, like, super-duper mega important and, like, a world-changing object of power of some kind. Um, it's interesting that Shoma is just sort of, like, dangling it over the edge, playing with it. He doesn't really care. He doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really give a damn about this super-critical, like, god-level object of weirdness he, he's just like yeah it's a, it's an apple I'll, i want to share it with somebody that'd be fun it's kind of strange i love the framing of all of these shots this one this one this one huh, i love them all particularly this one the angle down it's really cool stairways man stairways actually speaking of stairways elevators and stairways and ecohara works are often like portals to other dimensions or like portals to very different places or character moments uh we meet himari smack dab in the middle on a landing of a stairway she is right between places she is right upon the edge of chosen and not chosen invisible and visible part of a family and disconnected going to the child broiler and going home with shoma she's right on that precipice as the fruit of fate was okay clickety clackety clickety clackety gears are turning yeah, all right, yeah, cool. And we do the thing, we do the scarf wrap. It's pretty nice. It's pretty, it's weird. She's just gone, okay. And then we enter, enter this sort of undersea location, but I guess it's not, because there's undersea stuff, and then there are also penguins just standing, and there are fish, and there's the moon and the sun. It's everything. It's weird. I don't know. Neko. God, all of her voice lines, man. Every single one. Neko. Neko. Shimari's voice actress is a legend. Also, who's Shimari's voice actress? I kind of forgot. <laughs> I've already got ANN up. Uh, Himari. Miho Arakawa. What else have you done? Because you're really good, dude. Shizuku and Hunter Hunter. 
not enough. Somebody in Yurikuma Arashi. That's cool. Female clerk in one episode of Bento. Digimon Adventure. Girl, why aren't you in way more stuff? There's a one episode character in, in Happiness Charge Precure. Why aren't you in more stuff? You're really talented. She's really good. What the fuck, industry? Hire this person more. Oh my god, she actually kind of looks like Himari. She's got like the, the little cute face and little orangey hairy stuff. Oh jeez. Okay. Cool. <sighs> this whole sequence is so cute. We get Sunchan. Have we had a, a Sunchan before? I feel like somebody mentioned that earlier, but I don't remember. I feel like I've heard Himari's voice actress say Sunchan. I just don't know when. Maybe it never happened. And then the whole voiceover for this whole sequence is the bomb diggity. And then back here we are. We must cleanse the world. Gendo posing. And Kanba has like a shadow of a doubt, but he puts it away. And then we have this moment of Himari berating her food as she does. Come home soon, everybody. I'm waiting for you once again. Okay. I'm going to take a minute, go through all of the dialogue again, and see if I can parse anything interesting from it. And maybe I'll see some other interesting visual things as well, but this will be a place to cut, so I'll cut here. Peace. All right, I went through it again. Let's start with the beginning. There are, there are a few things that I gleaned from going through it again. Not, not a ton, but maybe quite a bit, actually. Okay. Um, opening line of the flashback is real interesting because it it kind of confirms some of the things that i was thinking about before certain condo it all started here there were many similar doors it's hard to tell which one's real which one's righteous if we view this as various ideologies or perspectives or worldviews all of them from the outside seemingly identical then everything i said about like people in boxes not going outside of their boxes makes a whole lot of sense it also makes a whole lot of sense that um That Shoma doesn't want to commit to any one of them because he's in this weird sense, weird state of of ambiguity where he he just wants to wander outside and is sort of sort of paralyzed by the abundance of choice of different ways to to be to view the world. Perhaps I find that pretty interesting as just a start to before we even see the place that we're talking about, and when we do see it, it is as we said before endless and gray and hopelessly huge and immense and the inside here is is framed this way and he uh, father goes goes onward and talks about this beautiful world where mankind only needs true things in order to survive um but truth itself is ambiguous and changes depending on your perspective to wholeheartedly throw yourself into one truth and to reject ambiguity is to reject the world as it is, to reject the gray areas. And that's just silly. So I find that pretty interesting. Um, don't remember where it was. Uh, it it might have been in that speech, actually, or it's in the, the other one. He says, uh, we live in a world ruled by those who will never amount to anything, which is, of course, uh, uh, the same line that the princess in the crystal or of the crystal uh, says to characters, but also immediately brings us into that, that uh, chosen and unchosen. And it's the same line that's used for the unchosen children who will become invisible. What will happen to them? They will never amount to anything. And that's awful. It's actually kind of worse than death, I think. Other things like it's a frozen world, but the flame of hope is still burning strong. Or Sure, buddy. Sure. Okay. Uh, the one frame or the one sequence where Shoma and Faceless Friend are sorting trash um, again continues to compound upon the choose the flammable from the non-flammable um, the sins and also focuses in on we're getting punished for the sins of others it's all their fault it's not our fault blah 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 and that kind of echoes uh, exactly the father's perspective which is like it's not fair that that 
we are chosen or unchosen, the world is unfair, blah, blah, we will rage against it with this flame of hope. But the episode itself rejects that idea, and that's where we get to the Himari sequence, where it all kind of ties together. Um, okay, a bunch of things happened before that. One is all the chalk drawings. I didn't even think about this while I was watching it, but... What if they're her drawings? Like, we don't know how long she's been living in the same space as this abandoned kitten. Uh, literally at the place where, where trash is being picked up is where she is. She's in with, like, I guess the laundry and the place where unused, abandoned things go. But her walls are decorated. And I, I think the more that I look at it, that all of these chalk drawings are her drawings. They're of a world that we do not see at all in these sequences of love and life and sun and moon and fish and trees and birds and plants and lovely things and penguins. She loves penguins. Like Momoka, she's somebody who loves everything but hasn't been given a reason to. And when I realized that this might be the case, it just kind of broke my heart. And I love Himari even more than I did before. So just wanted to throw that out there because, ow. And elements of this this background come to fruition in a weird way. The, the colorful and bright and vibrant and lovely aesthetic of it is embodied throughout the later half, latter half of the series as by their house, by their place. There's a weird irony to what appears to be a mother giraffe and a baby giraffe embracing. Um, I focused on the maybe pomegranate, which was probably silly, but a, a mother giraffe and a baby giraffe embracing while Himari is sitting abandoned by her own mother, it seems. Uh, but the way that it's framed behind her, it's like a part of her. It's associated with her. And eventually it becomes a part of their home, something that sits outside and has been a continuous piece of imagery that's associated with Himari. It's the thing that she cowered behind in the previous episode when Masako attacked. It's symbolic and valuable, as much so as the scarf tying them together or anything else. Okay. Uh... Her line about the cat, there. Why is it? Why is it here? Because it's an unneeded child. It was probably cared for it at first, but its cuteness was consumed, so it was thrown away. This is Himari's way. I think is Himari's way of rationalizing her own abandonment, like, or at least it's the worldview created by her abandonment. That makes more sense. Um, it leads to a belief that relationships and c connections are almost uh, financial. Um, that there's a transaction occurring. That love is given in exchange for cuteness, and when the cuteness dries up, the love stops coming. And that's not how it should work. We know that. But she doesn't. She's broken. Already well on her way to becoming broken. Shattered. Fuck. So then we have a moment where we get to know this kitten and we come to love it because we're gonna we're gonna take it away because tragedy is part and parcel to Ikahara's world's fuck you show. And then in the endless expanse of endless snow and buildings and places and grayness and awfulness, he runs and runs after it, but is hopeless to change anything. In the same way that the condo is hopelessly large and impossible to understand, let alone change, he chases it and is hopeless to change it. But he gets another chance to do exactly that. I'm going to the child broiler. He knows where she's going. To essentially a the dump, the waste disposal plant for people, for children. And so he runs again. And this is where... The episode all comes together and gives us our punchline, if you will, which is Shoma's father rails against the system, rails against that which chooses and, 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 or does not choose, 
rails against the unfairness and comes to the conclusion that the solution is to destroy, is to pass on the pain and continue causing pain and violence and death and destruction and despair. Just to pass it down along the line and that will make everything better. But it won't. The thing that makes everything better is knowing that we, as individual human beings, are the ones who choose. We are the ones who have the power to choose. And Shoma, throughout this ending sequence, embodies that power. There's a garbage truck going by. I'm going to give it a minute. The father of the Takakuras speaks and speaks and rages and convinces others to do genuinely evil acts in the name of changing the world and fixing this unfairness of choosing and not choosing. But Shoma, in his simplicity, in his naivete, in his ambiguity and acceptance of ambiguity and unwillingness to go wholeheartedly into one or another of these many rooms that make up the condominium, in his ability to float between them, finds his own power to reach out and choose somebody else. And it is that action which saves her. And it is that action which saves her. When we last see him in this episode, in the present, remembering this, it seems as though he's hard on himself for doing so. That it's his fault that she became a Takakura, that it's his fault that she was chosen. But what we see is something entirely different, which is that this is the best thing ever for her. This is bliss. That she had already been abandoned. Everything after that, after being chosen, has just been love for her. And that warms my heart. And it makes me very afraid for what's to come. <sighs> well, this has been a pair of Penguin Drum episodes. Uh, I think the clear highlight of this pair of Penguin Drum episodes is episode 20. Episode 19, while it was real fun while we were watching it, it was fun to talk about absolutely pales in comparison to the layers of symbolism and interesting stuff and the way that things continue to click in my head and connect and connect and connect as I keep thinking about this episode. Uh, episode 19 looks like a, a mediocre exposition dump in comparison, and that's saying something given how much I enjoyed episode 19. This real good. Me like a lot. Hope you liked it too. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and stuff. It's been, it's been fun. And, um... We're going to wrap here, and uh, next week will be 21 and 22, and then it'll be 23 and 24 for the finale. Jesus. Okay, well, I've been Tiabu. This has been Memoiru Penguin Drum, episodes 19 and 20. I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have, and I hope to catch you next week in the next ones. If you want to get those next episodes a week early, you can totally do that. They're available on Patreon. Check it out. It's linked in the description and stuff. Um... If you already are a Patreon, Patreon supporter, thank you very much. You are appreciated, and I love you. And, uh, yeah, can't wait for Wednesday. See you next week. Peace. <laughs>